Well, I like Michigan Sabbaths, particularly in June. It's always a, uh, a a little bit of a a letdown when the Sabbath is over with, and you realize that the six days of labor begin. And uh, in Michigan, you don't start the six days of labor in June until uh, much later than most places I've spoken. So uh, very um, nice to see it linger uh, here in Michigan. Uh, By the way, uh, a little bit, a lot of people have been asking uh, about Weimar. Uh, Of course, I've mentioned it a few times, but I really haven't talked a lot about what's going on at Weimar. Uh, Weimar has, uh, is a higher education program. It was Weimar College for a number of years. Um, 1978 is when it started, but now it's uh, become Weimar University as a result of having graduate level programs. Our uh, student uh, dorms are completely full uh, and our, our programs uh, overall are thriving. We have started a registered nursing school, both, both an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree. And even though it's been in existence for just six years, the Nurses' Almanac actually rates it up there among the top of the nursing programs in the 11 Western states. And one of their rankings has to do with how long you've been in existence. So the fact that we're getting at the top and we've been existing less than all of the others that are underneath uh, tells us that we'd be ranked even higher uh, if we would have been in existence longer. But they're, they're looking at all of the nursing aspects. Of course, one of the advantages is we have a small program and so that really helps our nurses, nursing students, to learn well from our great mentors that are there. Uh, not one of our uh, nursing students has, uh, has failed boards in six years, so they've noticed that. Um, but they also learn the scientific aspects of lifestyle medicine. And I can tell you that the typical physician and traditional medical care is woefully Um, uh, what should we say, not very knowledgeable in regards to the science of lifestyle medicine. When I first got involved in lifestyle medicine, it was often called alternative medicine. It's not called that anymore simply because the science behind lifestyle medicine is actually more solid, or at least just as solid, if not more solid than it is in regards to traditional medicine aspects. And the science is accumulated so strongly that it is no longer even hinted that it's non-scientific medicine. But nonetheless, you know, traditional medicine has its role in regards to diagnosis, it has its role in regards to um, surgery and procedures, and it has its role in regards to pharmaceuticals. Uh, But beyond that, uh, doctors are not necessarily an expert uh, in that field. And of course, Weimar is is actually um, uh, making up the difference in that gap. So when a nursing student is taking care of a patient with hypertension and heart disease, they'll be able to give them solid scientific information that can't be refuted by any physician because it's from peer-reviewed studies that they have looked at, and they'll be able to help that patient possibly even more than any pharmaceutical could have helped that patient, or with whatever the disease process is. And so our nurses are very much in hot demand when they come out. And uh, they have already, during those six years, developed a very solid reputation. And so uh, they are uh, doing a great work, and they're also learning how to do the threefold ministry. That threefold ministry is education, and it is also the healing message, but on top of that, the sharing of the gospel message and the practical gospel in their healing process. And that's a, a crucial part that every Weimar student learns. No matter what program you're in, you're going to learn the threefold ministry uh, at Weimar. We also have uh, a, a program, of course, in religion, pastoral training. We have a great education program. 
our education students actually start teaching on day one. We have an elementary school that is actually um, headed up by one of our, our um, uh, educators at the college as well. And um, they start learning classroom management from the very beginning. And by the time they have finished in four years, they've actually been teaching for four years. They've been doing the practical training and not just an internship. Most of the students coming out of other education programs, they've had that one internship for maybe six months uh, and, uh, and haven't had all of the aspects of that teaching of threefold ministry. In fact, some of our students are doing some exciting things. Uh, one of our education students is actually brilliant when it comes to putting science down to a first and second grade level. And uh, we've had uh, people visiting Weimar Elementary to uh, see whether they want their kids going there, even people from the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, you know, well over 100 miles away from where Weimar is at. And they'll sit in that science class and they'll say, I'm going to do what it takes to find a job in this area because I want my kids in this school. They'll be talking about their amygdalas in second grade. They'll be talking about their frontal lobes and their hippocampus and all of those things and different neurotransmitters and, and learning all of that brain health aspect of things. And they'll also be learning how to manage their emotions because she's also teaching them the emotional intelligence curriculum. In fact, she's done so well that um, uh, myself, along with some uh, team players at Weimar, uh, were recently asked to develop a K-12 through curriculum for public schools and emotional intelligence by the Ninth Circuit, which is the federal circuit system out there in California and the West Coast and Guam in those areas and it's actually being piloted uh, right now with some very positive results and uh, she's actually teaching even though she hasn't even graduated yet she's teaching experienced teachers in first and second grade how to make science exciting in the brain and all of those sorts of things and they're loving it and putting those things uh, into practice uh, we also uh, have a, a business program that has healthcare administration uh, one of the things I've learned from Dr. Hart, president of Loma Linda, is that in many of our mission hospitals, they can't find good administrators. And they can't find people to really make ends meet and to keep it going. And so we're helping along that process by uh, training mission-minded business people to bring the threefold ministry forward and to be um, actually promoting that uh, significantly. And also business management uh, program on top of that, uh, we also have a interdisciplinary psychology program. Uh, and then we also have a master's in uh, psychology as well. Uh, it's counseling and wellness where you learn the cognitive behavioral therapy principles, but you also learn the principles that will help people to per permanently make and stay with positive lifestyle choices. A lot of that has to do with things in the mind, as we talked about a couple of nights ago, or, or last night in, in particular. And, uh, and so that's an important aspect of being able to understand where the patient is at and moving them forward. On top of that, we have the, missions in, uh, the uh, uh, mission program, a master's in mission and biblical wellness that actually trains pastors to revitalize churches, plant new churches, and uh, fortunately, the Michigan Conference has teamed up with Weimar University, so several of our students are actually going to be doing their practical aspects here in Michigan, and we would like your feedback from them, because if they don't revitalize your church, or if they don't plant a vibrant new church, they don't get a master's degree from Weimar. And so they've learned all of the practical aspects on how to do that. They're going to be mentored by great people, including... One of our professors is your former conference president, Jay Gallimore, who will be mentoring them here in Michigan uh, and uh, helping with that process. And so um, uh, we're excited that Michigan, along with other conferences, are, um, are uh, teaming up uh, with Weimar uh, in that way. Uh, we, um, I think that uh, encompasses, I'm sure I've, I've, well, of course, the pre-med program. Uh, we should mention that. 
the natural science program. That's one of the reasons why I got interested in Weimar, because I had a, a thriving practice in Ardmore, Oklahoma, uh, and I was hiring mid-levels, PAs, nurse practitioners, trying to hire other physicians to be able to carry the load because people were coming from all over to see me not only in the community, but they would hear from us down in Texas and they'd be crossing the border and then they would be hearing from us in other states. And so we didn't have enough personnel and I don't wanna turn people down that need healing. And so I was wanting to recruit more physicians and every lifestyle medicine physician I tried to recruit, I found out they were in the same condition I was in where they had so many patients flocking to them that they didn't have enough help, and so they couldn't come and help me. And so I realized we actually need to get more lifestyle medicine physicians by going back to the educational part of things. Now, with the medical school, they're so busy with all of the things that are involved in learning to pass boards and the pharmaceuticals, as well as the biochemical aspect and the diagnostical aspect, that they don't have a lot of time to learn about lifestyle medicine. And I knew the best place to learn that is in the pre-med portion of things. That's when you're taking your basic sciences. And so we do have a great pre-med program, uh, very high acceptance in the US medical schools, and they learn the basic sciences, but they also learn lifestyle treatments of disease. They learn principles of health. They learn good nutrition aspects, which many doctors don't even take a course in nutrition uh, by the time they graduate from medical school. And they learn um, how to treat chronic diseases, and they're actually interfacing with patients. They're actually with me as students. They actually have to take a course where they shadow the physician to look at the biochemical aspect of the brain and learn about genetics and epigenetics and those sorts of things. And they don't have any question that lifestyle medicine is solidly scientific when they leave Weimar. In fact, normally they've actually helped to publish some studies. Weimar actually is, uh, even though it's a small university, it publishes a lot of uh, studies in the peer review literature. And they'll also be attending these major conferences and explaining what's going on there at Weimar. And uh, it has been exciting because now that Weimar, in fact, um, I was just with a student here today that's part of your Michigan uh, camp meeting who had done his undergraduate work at Weimar. And he was down in the medical school at Loma Linda. And he said, I, I gathered together a group. He's his, in his first year of medical school, and this is his only summer off. But he said, I gathered together the Weimar uh, uh, physicians and also dentists, there's pre-dent down there as well. And they said there are 70 that we brought together for lunch. And so that means there's going to be 70 physicians <laughs> that are lifestyle medicine physicians branching out over the country. And uh, we can start uh, uh, filling uh, that gap. And of course, we also have the New Start program. So if you have uh, any physical disease, chances are lifestyle medicine can, can play a role in helping. If you want to know if it's going to play a significant role and the program would help, then you can call Weimar and ask about your condition. It'll be a free um, a case manager, a free consultation with a case manager to see if that would help, and they'll interface with the physician. And then we also have the depression and anxiety recovery program for any of the depression or anxiety related mental illnesses from panic disorder to PTSD to ADHD uh, to uh, depression, major depression, bipolar depression and other forms of, of depression and anxiety as well. And God is, is blessing these programs tremendously. There are miracles that occur in every one of these programs and lives are saved and it's a really a thrilling uh, I, I, I obviously love my job, but it's a thrilling institution to be a part of. And so I'd like to encourage you, all of you are actually invited to Weimar um, the third Thursday of every March when we put on our Emotional Intelligence Summit. We have speakers from all over the nation, and you'll be able to see the new Weimar campus, the new buildings that are there, and be able to see the beautiful um, uh, campus that we have on the Sierra foothills. And uh, if you know of anyone who would like to, 
uh, even uh, more older people take advantage of our master's programs or even our bachelor's programs. We do have a booth over there in the booths, and I know our two students uh, at Weimar uh, would love it if you would go over there and sign an interest card uh, after this meeting, and that way you'd be able to find out more about um, Weimar. Well, this presentation uh, tonight is being glad while persecuted. And before we begin this important presentation, I am just going to kneel and ask for the Holy Spirit's presence here tonight. Father in heaven, we, I thank you for how you have led in this camp meeting and this important special message that is to prepare a people to meet you. I pray that you will incline each heart and each mind. I know the devil is going to try to come up with distractions, but may not one blessing that you prepared for us go over our heads miss due to lack of attentiveness or distractibility, but may we receive every principle that you want us to not only know, but actually participate in and also fully endorse so that we can all soon go home. In Jesus' name, amen. So, being glad. We talked about that a little bit today. And I was so happy to see so many making a stand for God in choosing the narrow way. Being glad involves dopamine, as we talked about. It, dopamine is actually manufactured in the brain. And we didn't go to the nutritive aspects, but there is an amino acid called L-tyrosine. It's present in things like mustard greens and pumpkin seeds and watermelon. And uh, we could go to those content. This actually, actually goes into the process of the blood-brain barrier. And then we can start manufacturing dopamine in the brain. We can't give IV dopamine. That won't work because the dopamine won't cross the blood-brain barrier and the dopamine has to go into the brain. So we have to have a manufacturing plant to be able to actually produce that, and then the right receptors that are there. What we were talking about in regards to lifestyle factors those that adversely affect uh, dopamine is they can adversely affect the production as well as those receptors. And so, of course, in order for dopamine to be working in making you glad and properly motivating you, dopamine is also a proper motivation, a healthy motivation chemical. It has to bind to receptors in order for that to occur. We talked about a little bit about uh, how dopamine can go down, uh, but also I wanted to mention a little bit about how it can go up. Outdoor physical exercise, uh, helps considerably in building up those dopamine receptors and it actually fosters a greater production of dopamine. There have been some new, there's been some new research on forest bathing. One of the reasons why people get happy at Weimar is we have wonderful evergreen trees. Year-round, tall, dense evergreen trees. And that pine uh, release of the oils of the pine actually are mood enhancing. And they actually are mood enhancing because of what they are doing to dopamine levels. And there's other aspects of, of trees when we are walking through a forest that can have a very positive impact on our, um, on our thinking and our mood. I talked about after four months of healthy food with no sugar, your dopamine receptors also go up uh, considerably. Uh, and uh, healthy friendships and live social interaction. Actually, social media has been shown to actually do the opposite. Uh, social media makes us antisocial, and uh, it, the normal use of social media actually, uh, studies show that first you are attracted to connect, but you do a lot more comparing than connecting. 
And comparing ourselves among ourselves is not wise, particularly when it comes to the false world of social media, because people only post what they want you to know about them. They're not posting what happened one second before that picture was taken or one second afterwards, because you wouldn't be a bit attracted <laughs> if you could see that. And so it's just, uh, it's kind of a false world that produces actually some adverse dopamine effects that have been well demonstrated. Learning new things helps dopamine uh, to uh, be engaged to receptors. And uh, this is um, one of the five aspects of naturally improving dopamine levels. Even learning from the Bible, which hopefully we'll do tonight, can actually improve our dopamine levels. I don't know if you've seen someone go through an evangelistic series before where they're just learning these new things, but you will see their mood significantly enhanced as they're engaging in these Bible studies and they're incorporating this uh, into them just because of the positive brain chemistry that's happening from learning Bible prophecy and other aspects of the Bible. But we're going to be talking about particularly being glad while persecuted. And so I'd like you to open your Bibles, if you have them this evening, to Acts, the 16th chapter. And we're going to analyze a situation that is important for us to understand with where our world is going today and what is soon to take place. So Acts chapter 16 will be starting from verse 12. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. Now Philippi is now in Greece, but it was in a country called Macedonia back then. And it was a colony that was first a Grecian colony, then a Roman colony. And, and Paul is visiting um, this city as he is continuing his missionary endeavors. Verse 13, on Sabbath, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. And now they had a much uh, better place to stay as they were doing their mission work there. Verse 16, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her master's much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. This is kind of interesting as to why this woman would say that when she was an agent of Satan. And essentially, Paul's messages were starting to change minds so readily that Satan decided to utilize this girl to kind of dovetail in on what they were doing and deactivate their message uh, and also maybe be able to expand his message. By the way, when the devil starts actually dovetailing on God's people, uh, you know that God's people are being quite effective in what they're doing. And so... <clears throat> Acts of the Apostles explains that this woman was a special agent of Satan, had brought to her masters much gain by soothsaying, her influence had helped to strengthen idolatry, and Satan knew that his kingdom was being invaded, and he resorted to this means of opposing the work of God, hoping to mingle his sophistry with the truths taught by those who were proclaiming the gospel message. The words of recommendation uttered by this woman were an injury to the cause of truth, distracting the minds of the people from the teachings of the apostles 
and bringing disrepute upon the gospel. And by them, many were led to believe that the men who spoke with the spirit and power of God were actually actuated by the same spirit as this emissary of Satan. Now, whenever things like this are going on, what we have found out, and we actually teach this in the business program at, at Weimar, the Bible is filled with economy and business principles, but what is being affected soon has a lot to do with the economy of Philippi. And you know, even in our economy today, there is money to be made by frontal lobe suppressants. One of the easiest ways to make money is to sell things that suppress the frontal lobe of the brain because those are going to be addictive as well. And they're going to produce um, some sort of, of dopamine rush. So if you can do dopamine rush and addiction at the same time, this is a good business. And you don't even have to be, be a very good businessman <laughs> to start making money in regards to the sale of these frontal lobe suppressants. By the way, these frontal lobe suppressants are one of the primary reasons why the great deception is going to occur in the time of the end. Revelation, uh, I think it is chapter 19, um, actually asks the question, why was so much of the world deceived by Babylon? Because Babylon is false. It's false teaching. And, you know, virtually the whole world gets deceived by this. And the answer is by their pharmakia. Where do we get that? Pharmacy. So it's the drugging of the brains that actually open the way for deception. So frontal lobe suppressants are actually more readily available today than ever before in human history. And you can suppress your frontal lobe. I mean, caffeine is also a frontal lobe suppressant. It blocks the adenosine receptors. Uh, and uh, entertainment television is actually a frontal lobe suppressant. We can uh, go into that. It's highly addictive uh, as well. And so... A lot of these fun things, you know, the interesting thing is we're living in an era where there's more fun things to do than ever before in human history, but yet we have more depression and anxiety than ever before in human history. If these fun things actually prevented depression and anxiety, we should see the lowest rates. But these fun things are short-term gain, long-term problems, and we're actually seeing the mental health consequences of this drugging down of America. But there's money to be made in magic. Even today, there was a, an individual that I know who's a, uh, a successful businessman in Europe, and he does a lot of things in regards to computer programs, and he realizes the gaming industry is a great way to make money. And so he had his team produce a video game that was a highly engaging video game but he was told by the video distributors that they would not take it unless he inserted magic into it. He said every video game has to have some magic or spiritualism aspect of things. And yeah, we like your game. It won't take much to do that, but you've got to put the magic into it. And he decided that he was not going to try to sell video games if that's what it took. Uh, in regards to the magic, and the Lord has blessed him by going other directions. But there is money to be made also by psychics, and there is money to be made by those who are possessed. And you know, many individuals that are possessed by demons don't look like they're possessed by demons. They don't necessarily, uh, or hardly ever, act like the demonics in the Bible, uh, per se. Uh, they actually look like they have it all together, uh, but they're possessed individuals that are out there to try to deceive, and particularly they're uh, very much associated with the sex um, industry um, as well. And so there's money to be made in all of these aspects of things, and there's also money to be made with um, those that say they will help you communicate with dead relatives 
and, and uh, that aspect of things. And when the true gospel is going to be preached, do you think it's make, going to make a difference in regards to your use or the public's use of those things that are on the screen right now? Oh, yes. If the gospel is preached effectively, it will make a powerful influence, and frontal lobe suppressants will no longer be searched for, and it's going to start changing economies. Uh, so let's go into now verse 18 as we pick up the story and see what happened. Verse 18, she did this for many days. So Paul put up with this for a while. But he could see the effects of this. And Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, so what is it that made them make these decisions on what they were going to do next? It was money. Their money was going down. They seized Paul and Silas. So watch out when positive behavior changes start to become viral. We'll, we are told this will happen as a result of medical missionary work entering into city after city. We are going to see positive changes actually become viral, not just a few people here or there, but it's going to start to go more exponential like it was with Paul and Silas and the converts there in Philippi. So, dispossessed of the evil spirit and restored to her right mind, the woman chose to become a follower of Christ. Then her masters were alarmed for their craft. They saw that all hope of receiving money from her divinations and soothsayings was at an end and that their source of income would soon be entirely cut off if the apostles were allowed to continue the work of the gospel. So their income's down, but they see it going down further. If those... Two are still allowed. So let's read verse 19. Well, we read verse 19. Uh, I guess we didn't finish it. They dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Verse 20, they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. And a mob spirit, we're told, prevailed. Was sanctioned by the authorities who tore the outer garments from the apostles and commanded that they should be scourged. So you see in 22, the multitude rose up together against them. Magistrates tore off their garments, commanded them to be beaten with rods, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Do you think this was suffering for Paul and Silas? Absolutely. And particularly since they had done nothing wrong. They were actually improving the city considerably. You know... <clears throat> Whose rights were being violated here? Paul and Silas. But the news story would have told us that Paul and Silas were violating those other people's rights. And notice this phrase from Acts of the Apostles speaking of this. Satan is constantly seeking to introduce distrust, alienation, and malice. Who is he seeking to bring that up towards? It's God's people. Whenever God's people are doing something very powerful, one of the indications is you are going to be accused of not being trustworthy, of being divisive and you will see individuals coming after you with malice. 
We shall often be tempted to feel that our rights are invaded even when there is no real cause for such feelings. Now, in Paul and Silas' case, there was a real cause for the feelings, but in those men, there was no real cause. Their rights weren't being violated at all. But they were tempted to feel that their rights were being invaded. And notice how if something were to happen where you're going to start to lose your income or those sorts of things, you will have an indication on how you're responding to that because it says those whose love for self is stronger than their what? Love for Christ and His cause will place their own interests first and will resort to almost any expedient to guard and maintain them. And that's what these guys were doing. These guys actually leagued up with others whose frontal lobe suppressants weren't being bought and they said, we need to get this whole city involved. We're going to go down economically, and we need to take them to the authorities. Interestingly, people who make money through suppressing other people's frontal lobes are virtually always tightly connected to politicians, at least in their area. And so those politicians are very much wanting to listen to them because also their campaign donations are dependent on this. And so the economy uh, goes further. So let's read verse 24. Having received such a charge, this is the jailer, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. They were not laid on a nice, smooth floor like this. They were laid on an irregular dirt floor with rocks in them. After their backs were laid open, their feet are put up in stocks, and there they are crying uncontrollably in prison and saying, why are you allowing this, Lord? first part of the story is true. The second part isn't true. Notice what is stated. The apostles suffered what? Extreme torture because of the painful position in which they were left. Not only were their feet put up in stocks, but those chains were tightened way down on those feet, and it was extremely painful. But she doesn't end there. She puts a but. But they did not murmur. What? They didn't murmur? I can tell you if something like that would have happened to me and my rights would have been violated, I would have been talking out loud about how my rights had been violated. <laughs> I would be actually trying to get people to realize that, wait a minute, we didn't do anything wrong. What laws have we broken? What laws are going on? This is, this is just wrong. And, and try to um, gain a voice, even though it might have just been my voice and Silas's voice. But here, they're not talking about their rights being violated at all. Our behaviors do powerfully influence our emotions, but it's our thoughts that cause our emotions and behavior. And your feelings result from the messages you give yourself. Your thoughts have much more to do with how you feel than what is actually happening in your life. Those are the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy that we actually teach in our master's program. The thoughts are so powerful that they have so much more to do with how you are feeling than what is actually happening in your life. And so what were they thinking? What were those thoughts that they weren't even talking about their extreme torture? They weren't even talking about their rights being violated. One of the things they knew was this. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. 
when you're asked to be suffer, when God, you know, the, one of the things, by the way, this is a promise. This is a promise, not for everybody. If you see the context of this promise, this is only for those who have given themselves completely to God in his service. Because the world is constantly being tempted above what they're able. They don't have the frontal lobe ability. They're being controlled by their limbic system. They're constantly being tempted above what they're able to bear. But when you are part of God's army, anything that comes to you has to come through Him first. And the fact that they were being asked to do that they realized Christ must think a lot. Christ must actually think a lot about our abilities <laughs> through him. Because they're allow he's allowing us to suffer in this way. They also knew, with the temptation, also make a way of escape that ye may be able to what? It doesn't mean that the temptation is going to go away. It doesn't mean that the trial is going to go away. It doesn't mean that the pain is going to go away. But they knew that with Christ, they could endure. Paul wrote about this later to Philip. To his letter to Philippi is called what? Philippians, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have what? Suffered the loss of all things, that I may know him. There's a purpose in the suffering. What is the purpose in the suffering? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the what? Fellowship of his sufferings. Here's what happens. When you are true and faithful to God and you suffer, you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, and you are in the midst of your suffering, there's something automatically that starts to happen, and your love for Christ grows far deeper. Because every bit of suffering you have, you are now recognizing Christ suffered this. Christ went through this. My Savior went through this. And He went through it because of sin. He would have never had to do this had there not been sin and because of his love for me. And so you start developing a much deeper and greater love for the Lord and you also start to develop a more accurate hatred for sin and its effects. And this is something that's very important for us to understand. Because as Laodiceans, we don't view sin in its right way very often. You know, every one of the churches had commendations and recommendations. There's no commendation for the last day church. There's something that comes close to the commendation, and that is you don't know how wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked you are. You're in bad shape, but you don't know that you're in bad shape. And this is talking about professed people of God. Professed people of God don't have the deep love for our Master that other, uh, many others of those six previous churches had, nor do they have the accurate view of sin. Instead, in the utter darkness and desolation of the dungeon, they encouraged each other by words of prayer and sang praises to God because they were found worthy to what? Suffer shame for his sake. Their hearts were cheered by a deep and earnest love for the what? For the cause of their Redeemer. They were also excited about the fact that what they were doing was working in Philippi. Paul thought of the persecution he had been instrumental in bringing upon the disciples of Christ. So as he is now suffering, he's realizing, you know what? I caused 
good people to suffer in the past. Yes, this is happening to me, but I was actually an instigator for this type of thing in the past. And he rejoiced that his eyes had been opened to see and his heart to feel the power of the glorious truths which once he despised. Now this amazing phrase from Desire of Ages, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. So God allowed this to happen because it was best for Paul and Silas and best for his work. He writes to the Philippians, unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to what? Suffer for his sake. The quote goes on in Desire of Ages, of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men, fellowship with Christ in his what? sufferings is the most weighty trust and the highest honor. And when we are suffering for Christ's sake, it is going to have an effect on others. Notice what it did. With astonishment, the other prisoners heard the sound of prayer and singing issuing from the inner prison. They had been accustomed to hear shrieks and moans, cursing and swearing breaking the silence of the night, but never before had they heard words of prayer and praise ascending from that gloomy cell. Guards and prisoners marveled and asked themselves who these men would be, could be, who, cold, hungry, and tortured, could yet what? It wasn't just the torturing. They were cold. They were hungry. But yet, there's not a bit of murmuring and they're singing and they're rejoicing. This made a tremendous impact. Even the jailer and the sheriff heard it. Now, while this is happening, the people who had beat them and thrust them in congratulated themselves that they had prevented problems in their city. And as they're going back from the jail and saying, all right, we prevented some major problems, they actually ran into the woman who had been freed by, from satanic influence and were struck by the change in her countenance and demeanor. In the past, she had caused the city much trouble, but now she was quiet and peaceable. And they be, then they heard more things about Paul and Silas and all the good things they were doing. And as they realized that in all probability they had visited upon two innocent men the rigorous penalty of the Roman law, Ellen White says this, they were indignant with what? Themselves. They realized they had messed up. But they didn't immediately try to correct it. So let's go back to Acts 16, verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. What does this tell us? Christ will eventually take care of his own. He's actually taking care of his own even in this process, but he will take care of his own. While these men were cruel and vindictive on Paul and Silas or criminally negligent devolving upon them, God had not forgotten to be gracious to his servants. All heaven was interested in the men who were suffering for Christ's sake and angels were sent to visit the prison. When you are suffering for Christ's sake, all heaven is noticing. And how you're suffering for Christ's sake, they are also noticing. At, the tread, the earth trem at, the tr at their tread, the earth trembled, the heavily bolted prison doors were thrown open, the chains and fetters fell from the hands and feet of the prisoners, and a bright light flooded the prison. Now notice verse 27. The keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep, 
and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to what? Kill himself. So in the midst of the story, we see an attempted suicide, or at least a near attempted suicide. The sheriff had a rather high-paying job for his level of education. Why was his job so high-paying? Because it was dangerous. (laughs) And he was a mean guy. He would inflict greater torture on those he was afraid of or he thought deserved it. And for this group, he was told to really keep him in the inner prison, keep him secure, so he knew he was very responsible for Paul and Silas. And after a guy like this inflicts such extreme and unfair torture on you, how might you be tempted to think about him in the future? Or even right then? That's the amazing thing about Paul and Silas. This guy was as mean as a skunk, meaner than a skunk to them. And he's torturing them, tightening it far more than what he needs to. They're singing praises to God, and they don't have one bit of hatred for that man. They're looking at the bigger perspective. They're not getting angry at him. Keeper of the jail had heard with amazement their prayers and songs. When they were let in, he saw their swollen, bleeding wounds, and he himself had caused their feet to be fastened in the stock. He had expected to hear from them bitter groans and imprecations, but he heard instead songs of joy and praise. So what leads to suicidal acts? Thoughts that death are preferable to life are always there. But often, it's to avoid humiliation. And we're told in the bitterness of this jailer's spirit, he felt that it was better for him to die by his own hand than to submit to a disgraceful execution. And he didn't want to be humiliated, and he knew he was going to die anyways because that was the punishment if the prisoners were let free. So he had feelings of hopelessness, which is also part of thinking suicidal thoughts. Thoughts that his needs would never be fulfilled again. Loss of income with nothing to fall back on. But it also might include a romantic breakup is what can also lead to suicidal acts or a diagnosis of a terminal disease. Uh, with suffering uh, or thoughts of never being happy again. So let's read verse 28. Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for what? We are all here. And you know, research has documented that negative thoughts which cause emotional turmoil nearly always contain gross distortions. The thoughts on the surface appear valid, but you will learn that they are irrational or just plain wrong and that twisted thinking is a major cause of suffering. And when people are thinking of suicidal thoughts, they are thinking very twisted thoughts. And so Paul stops the suicide. How did he avert the suicide? He gave him factual information to get rid of his distorted thoughts. Now, interestingly, when people are thinking of ending their life, or actually starting to think about carrying it out in means, they are actually more willing to put their all on the altar of sacrifice. They're willing actually to take themselves out of life, period. That's where this man was. But instead of taking yourself out of life, what about just submitting your carnal desires and letting Christ live within you? The prisoners were all there, Paul said, to the love and compassion for the community by Paul and the prisoners' willingness to obey the servants of the Lord. Paul knew it wasn't good for the community for those guys to be out there, and they listened to Paul, and they stayed right there. Interestingly, at the end of May of this year, we had 20 patients come through depression and anxiety recovery program. 
13 of those were contemplating and many had even recently attempted to take their own life. But in 10 days, all 13 no longer had it on their radar screen even of any thoughts of ending their life. Without any external pressure, just telling them facts as Paul did to the jailer, those 13 patients were not anywhere close to ever ending their life. Ten of those patients had made the decision to no longer live their life, but Christ's life within them. And nine of them got baptized at the end of the program. As a result of this factual information, the sheriff was no longer afraid of losing his job, no longer afraid of losing his life. He had put his life in the hands of the Almighty, and he decided to trust and obey Him and serve the lovely and truthful Savior that he heard about from Paul and Silas. And he actually even started to wash the wounds of Paul and Silas. He was so thankful for what they had done actually for him. And so what is needed today is to make revival and reformation our first work. The willingness to put our all on the altar of sacrifice laid for Jesus and the salvation of others and the willingness to follow all of the commands and recommendations of our Lord then we will be ready to corporately experience the outpouring of the latter rain. And after that latter rain is poured out, as it's being poured out, we are told there will be a time of trouble such as never was, when waves of despair, which no language can express, that's how it's described by Ellen White, will descend upon the faithful. In Great Controversy 6.21, she talks about this in the time of Jacob's trouble. Their affliction is great. The flames of furnace seem about to consume them, but it is what? Needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be what? Perfectly reflected. I've often wondered, why are the saints permitted to suffer in the time of Jacob's trouble? Because at that time, probation is closed. They have had their sins forgiven. They have had them repented of. So why this suffering? Because even though that's occurred, they still haven't developed a deep enough hatred for sin. And their love for God and Christ must grow deeper and deeper. And why is it important for that to happen before they go to heaven? Because we're told that this is the group of people that will end up judging the world and judging the universe. The last message to the last church says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me where? In my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in His throne. Each of these people will need to have a mental acuity and an emotional intelligence that puts them in a position far greater than any Supreme Court justice has ever been. Because they are going to be a Supreme Court justice for the universe. And so they have to have the proper hatred for sin and the deep love of the ruler of the universe. These are people that come out of Laodicea where sin is more attractive. Sin is more attractive in this age than it's ever been in any previous age. And there, it's also more addictive than it's ever been. But yet, it's this group of people that have been in this era that are going to actually be the most elevated people in heaven above. These are people that couldn't see their own wretchedness. They couldn't see their own blindness. Now I'll read the last words of the Beatitude that are often not memorized, spoken by Christ Himself. And I'm, you know, I'll read it from the Amplified Version. Blessed and happy and enviably fortunate and spiritually prosperous 
in the state in which the born-again child of God enjoys and finds satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of his outward conditions are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for being and doing right, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, to make sure you get it. Blessed, happy to be envied, and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of your outward conditions, are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely on my account. Be glad and what? Supremely joyful, for your reward in heaven is great. It's strong and intense. For in this same way, people persecuted the prophets who were before you. The last message to the last church. For those who follow Christ's um, recommendations fully of buying gold and the ISAF and the white raiment, these are people that have put all on the altar of sacrifice for the Lord. And they don't let go of Christ despite all of this suffering. They don't get let go of His law despite suffering. They're going to follow God's laws, not their own laws. And we're told this time of suffering is going to be prolonged. It's not just going to be short. But as a result, this group becomes the closest to Christ, the most honored of all the redeemed, and the best representatives for him throughout the universe. This is the group that becomes part of the 144,000 who will be the closest to Christ, serving right next to him throughout eternity. There is purpose in suffering. And there are those in this room that are suffering for righteousness' sake right now. There are those where lies are being said about them. Don't be upset. Don't murmur. Be supremely joyful. For God is preparing you for end time scenarios where eventually you will be his closest representative to new worlds that are formed. And you'll be able to tell of your experience and what sin actually does. What it did to Christ. What it did to you. And your clarity of mind will be wonderful in your judgment of the world. Let's pray. Father in Heaven, we thank You for these Beatitudes where You told us Blessed are you when you suffer for righteousness' sake. May we be as Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas went through that extreme torture, never murmured, and ended up winning souls in the process. And Philippi ended up having religious liberty. Never again during Bible times were apostles persecuted in Philippi. And Lord, we look forward to a time when never again any of your people will have to suffer for righteousness' sake because you indeed will be ruler of the universe and we will sing hallelujah. May the Lord God omnipotent reigneth and may fair justice last forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.